Substantial muscle damage occurs in the following days after performing intense exercise you're unaccustomed to. Delayed onset muscle soreness is considered to be a symptom of muscle damage in the scientific literature, and it's common for individuals to believe soreness is a strong indicator you've stimulated a muscle well. Interestingly, it isn't entirely clear if muscle damage is truly what independently causes delayed onset muscle soreness. There are many candidates on what causes soreness, and a lot more research is required before we can be certain of the relationship between damage and soreness. Besides soreness, it's frequently believed muscle growth directly occurs because exercising creates micro tears in the muscle. Your body responds by healing the micro tears and making the muscle bigger. These two videos with a combined near 40 million views both put forth this idea. But what does the literature say on the role of damage in muscle hypertrophy? In 2012, Brad Schoenfeld from New York, the same researcher who performed a comprehensive review on metabolic stress a year later, published a comprehensive review on muscle damage and hypertrophy. Four paths were noted between damage and gains. The first is that damage results in an inflammation response, and various inflammatory cells have been linked to muscle hypertrophy. The second relates to satellite cells. This one requires a little bit of explaining, but it's highly interesting. Muscle fibers have nuclei, called myonuclei, and the myonuclei are crucial for directing the formation of the proteins that ultimately make muscle fibers bigger. Each myonuclei is believed to oversee a certain amount of space within muscle fibers, termed the myonuclei domain, but there is a limit to the amount it can oversee, called the myonuclei domain ceiling. As a muscle fiber increases in size, the myonuclei domain increases until it hits its ceiling, limiting further muscle fiber growth. From here, additional myonuclei would be needed to enable further fiber growth. This is where satellite cells come in. They are found surrounding muscle fibers and can fuse to muscle fibers and donate nuclei, resulting in an increase in myonuclei which increases the muscle fiber growth capacity. This is where damage comes into play. Muscle damage appears to cause a significant increase in satellite cell activation, so perhaps damage can ultimately increase the number of myonuclei muscle fibers have, thereby meaning greater muscle fiber growth potential. The third path is that damage may potentiate IGF-1 production, and IGF-1 is involved in signaling hypertrophy. The fourth and final one is that damage causes muscle fiber swelling. Note, this swelling isn't the pump that occurs during training. Rather, it's swelling in the fiber days after training due to damage. But the mechanisms by which this swelling could create hypertrophy are hypothesized to be the same. That is, the swelling activates osmoreceptors that go on to promote hypertrophy. Yet, all four of these paths have notable problems. There is conflicting evidence on the role of inflammatory cells in hypertrophy. The events by which inflammatory cells are thought to contribute to hypertrophy may indeed occur in the absence of damage. With satellite cells, training that does not produce muscle damage can still cause significant satellite cell activation. In fact, aerobic training can activate satellite cells. In data indicating muscle damage may potentiate satellite cell activation, this may potentially be related to repairing the muscle fiber and connective tissue damage, not increasing the number of myonuclei in fibers. As for IGF-1 production, not all studies have actually found damage is associated with greater IGF-1 production, and as discussed in the metabolic stress section, several studies indicate temporary increases in anabolic hormones with training do not correlate with long-term hypertrophy. Finally, with muscle fiber swelling, also as discussed in the metabolic stress section, alternative data exists implying swelling may not be causative of hypertrophy. Other lines of scientific research further question the importance of muscle damage for stimulating hypertrophy. A 2011 USA study assigned 14 untrained men into a pre-trained or naive group. The naive group performed eccentric exercise on a leg cycle ergometer for 20 straight minutes at a somewhat hard exertion level, measured using a subjective scale, three times per week for eight weeks. The pre-trained group did the same thing, but they had a three-week ramp-up phase before their eight weeks, where they gradually acclimatized themselves to the training program. Due to this acclimatization phase, they ended up experiencing little amounts of damage and soreness across the training weeks, whereas the naive group experienced much higher damage and soreness levels across the training weeks. Yet, hypertrophy of the quadriceps ended up being comparable between both groups. Another 2016 study from Brazil found after untrained individuals performed a single training session, myofibular protein synthesis expectedly increased. Fascinatingly, however, this increase in myofibular protein synthesis did not correlate with muscle hypertrophy. 
Rather, it seems it was directed towards repairing the damage induced by that single training session. As the same subjects continued training for some weeks, which resulted in them experiencing less and less damage, as your body produces adaptations that make you resilient to muscle damage, it was only then the myofibular protein synthesis increase after training sessions correlated with muscle hypertrophy. Rephrasing all this, this data suggests after an initial workout that produces high muscle damage, the myofibular protein synthesis increase afterward is largely directed towards repairing the damage, not increasing muscle size. But after a few weeks of consistent training which allows the body to produce adaptations that reduce the damage experienced, then the myofibular protein synthesis response is strongly directed towards increasing muscle size. Various lines of evidence suggest excessive muscle damage may also be counterproductive for hypertrophy. For example, a 1999 USA study had men train eccentric bicep curls with these variables and found signs of damage and swelling persisted for seven days after the session. But once it subsided, muscle volume actually decreased to 10% of what it was before training, and it remained at this smaller size for numerous further weeks. This might be because excessive muscle damage causes partial or total destruction of subpopulations of muscle fibers. Marathon running has also been documented to cause significant muscle damage, yet some data finds marathon running decreases muscle fiber sizes. Furthermore, if muscle damage had additive effects on hypertrophy, we would expect using training variables that enhance damage to produce more growth, but this isn't the case. Higher repetitions likely cause more muscle damage, but we know they are similarly effective to lower reps for hypertrophy. Short rest between sets likely cause more muscle damage, but short rest between sets of exercises recruiting large amounts of muscle mass is actually suboptimal for hypertrophy. So crystallizing this section, there's no strong evidence muscle damage is a potent driver of muscle growth, and it doesn't appear to have additive effects on hypertrophy.